Good morning. And grace and peace to you. I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We welcome you to our worship service here at Grace Presbyterian this morning. It's good to be back with you. I seem to have had a, a rather mild case of uh, the COVID or Omicron, uh, but uh, feel fully recovered and uh, glad to be back with you. I, I wanted to share with you, I've only missed worship twice in my whole career. And both times were for COVID. <laughs> so, but it's, uh, it's good to be here. I do have a, a couple of announcements. Uh, one, I know some of you have already done it, but the annual statements, uh, contribution statements, are on the back table, and they're marked with your names on them. Rodney uh, wanted me to make sure that you knew that. Also, a reminder that there are envelopes in the chairs in front of you. And they are for the Deacon's uh, Assistance Fund that we do on the fifth Sunday of the month. And if you want to contribute to them, uh, feel free to do so. And you can put them in our drop-off box. Uh, again, we won't be collecting any offering today. But uh, encourage you to put your offering envelopes or your donations into the drop-off box. Those are the announcements that I have for today. Any other that any of you have? If not, let us worship the Lord our God. Please rise and join in the call to worship, followed by the prayer of adoration. Come, let us worship God, our Savior. Come, let us praise the one mediator between God and humankind. And now join me in the prayer of adoration. O oh, great shepherd of the sheep, we come before you today longing for guidance, for rest, for healing. We acknowledge that like sheep, we are prone to go our own way. 
to wander off and lose our bearings. You have brought us here together to worship you. We are within your gates. We rejoice and are glad. We praise you for the power of your presence among us. Quiet our hearts, calm our troubled spirits, remind us to listen, for we gather in the spirit of expectancy, eager to hear your voice. Amen. If we claim that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin before God, who is faithful and just, he will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, then, let us confess our sins before God, saying our prayer of confession together. 
God of unity and peace. You know that we talk much about peace, but at the same time make much trouble for ourselves and for each other. We quarrel in church, at home, at work, and even between nations and religions. We let our loyalties to things and ideas and even our nation surpass our loyalty to Jesus Christ. We think worldly wisdom sometimes looks better than the truth shown us by your incredible word. We hide from the cross, thinking ourselves too good or grand for such humiliation. Forgive us in your mighty mercy. Embrace us with the Spirit's power of reconciliation. Fill us with a powerful light that shines with love into all the world. And may we become even more committed to living Christ-like lives today and every day. Send us out, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though our sins are like scarlet, they shall become as white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, they shall become as wool. If you, O Lord, kept track of our sins, who among us could stand? Who could stand? But because you are a God of grace, a God of mercy, we can stand before you in confidence, knowing that you will forgive us of our sins. For just as Jesus was washed in the glory of God, and so our baptisms remind us of our new life in Jesus Christ. Friends, believe in the good news. For in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Please bow for the prayer of illumination. O oh, Holy Spirit, move in us today. Set our mind on things above, not on earthly things. Remove our pride and clear our distracted minds so that all we hear is the, your truth. Allow the scriptures to be life-changing and to renew our desire for you. Help us to understand clearly the message of your word. We want to know you more. Thank you for the message we will hear today. Amen. Our Old Testament reading today is from the book of Nehemiah, chapter 1, verse 4. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I, look up, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence, but the king said to me, Why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is, this is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and the gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, what are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven and I said to the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, May you let me 
may you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's grave, that I, that I may rebuild it. The word of the Lord. Some special music by Eloise. Thank you, Elois. At this time, I invite the uh, children to come down for this morning's children's message. Good morning. And so how are you two doing? Good. good. Have you had a good week? Yes. yes, good. That's very good. Well, today I, I want you to help me with something. I have a, a policy here, um, and do you know what does this say here? Life yeah, it's a life insurance policy. Now, do you know who it's for? Yeah, it's for me, and uh, and it's uh, it's worth a lot of money. Well, not really, but it's worth it's worth something. Okay. But do you know how the money is collected? Taxes. Mm -mm. How do how do how do we get the money that we put into this back? Um, well, the bank. Pass, yeah. Pass away, oh, family, yes. Money. You're right. You're right. That means I have to die. That doesn't sound so good. <laughs> but. It still means then you're going to get um, some money or whoever the beneficiary is. But, you know, there's actually something better than a life insurance policy. And it's something Jesus gives us. Do you know what that is? Kindness. Love, yes. And? Okay, he gives us forgiveness. 
And if we for are forgiven, we're supposed to accept him as our savior. as our savior, yes. And what does John 3:16 say? Do you guys know what that says? What that kind of tells us what Jesus gives us. <laughs> so for God so loved the world, only son that whoever believes in him shall have Okay, you, you just said it. What was the last part you said? An eternal life. Okay, this policy is only good if I die. <laughs> Jesus is going to give us something that's good for forever. It's eternal. And it means we live forever. Isn't that much better than, than a life insurance policy? <laughs> yeah. And, and that's really something that um, we have to let people know that, that that Jesus gives us something the world can't even begin to touch. And not enough money in the whole world is ever going to buy us eternal life. Because John 3.16 tells us simply what we must do. We must, we must love and John says, for God so loved the world that whosoever believeth, we have to believe in him. So if we believe in Jesus... Uh, and trust him as our Lord and Savior. He gives us something the world and no money in the world can even buy. And that's really good news. So, yeah. Well, that was a pretty deep subject, so thank you for helping me work through that. Um, I do have some... Uh, would you like some of those? You can take, a, take more than one and then give, give some away, Okay. <laughs> See, the more you give away, the more it's it's always good to give away. So <laughs> cuz the giver is is really gets more out of it than the person who's receiving it. So, all right, let's pray. Dear heavenly Father, Lord, you give us something that uh Lord nothing in this world can touch. Not even a, an insurance policy, a life policy. Not all the money in the world can give us eternal life. And, uh, Lord, we thank you that you have made that possible for us by uh, simply believing in you and trusting in you as our Lord and Savior. Lord, uh, just be with us. Help us, to, uh, help us to share that good news, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. All right. Give away. <laughs> you to stand.
remain standing for our gospel reading, reading from the gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, verses 35 through 38, and I will be reading out of your English standard version that is our pew Bible. Hear now the word of our Lord. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless. They were like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest and send out labors into his harvest. The word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. <clears throat> o oh Lord, may the words of my heart and the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart and the actions of our lives be accepted, O oh Lord, as you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, verses 35 through 38, was actually an opening devotion that was used for a certified transitional pastor class that I was taking on evangelism and discipleship. It was being taught by Dr. Jim uh, Singleton, and he had us read this text a couple of times, and then in a small group share what it was saying to us. Reading Jesus' words when it says that he saw the crowds and he had compassion on them took me back uh, a time to when I was first feeling my call into ministry. It was in 1992, and we were gathered around uh, a person's homes. There was about 15 of us. And we were uh, around a, a piano, and we were singing a hymn for my first time, Here I Am, Lord. And as singing the words, I felt the power of the Holy Spirit tugging at my heart and feeling a call into ministry, especially when I heard uh, the second line. It, it choked me up. I, I could barely even sing the words. I, I have borne my people's pain. I have wept my love for them. They turn away. I will break their hearts of stone. Give them hearts of love alone. I will speak my words to them. Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. I have heard you calling in the night. If you, I will go, Lord. If you will lead me, I will hold your people in my heart. When I focus on this verse from Matthew, I felt a call not into pastoral ministry, but a call into being a transitional pastor. And it was actually after that that I decided to circulate my, uh, my PIF, my personal information form, that I was ready to make that move. So this, this scripture and this song have a, of a place in my heart. You heard from the prophet Nehemiah that Ray read, and actually what was said in there is what teaches us what we need to do in order to go out. You see, he was one of the Jews that were taken captivity by the Babylonians, taken into Babylon, but at this particular time, Babylon has been taken over by the king of Persia. And Nehemiah has an honored position. He is the cupbearer to that king. And because of his position, the things that he heard at that very first scripture were words of what was happening back in Jerusalem or what was still going on. 
which was that the walls of Jerusalem were still down, the gates were burned, the temple was still leveled, and when Nehemiah heard these things, he was deeply grieved, and he knew he must do something. Well, like Nehemiah, to evangelize, to be seekers of the lost, we got to grieve, we have to grieve for those who don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Someone once said that not much is going to happen evangelically for us until we actually grieve. Let me ask you this question. Are you conscious of the fact that there are people that you know personally, and some maybe not so personal, they could be family members, they could be anyone friends, neighbors, members of our church community who are in danger of eternal damnation because they don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior? What should be our response? Well, in our text from Matthew 9, 36, Jesus saw the crowds and it says he felt compassion for them. Now, the disciples and Jesus are both looking at that same sea of people But Jesus saw something the disciples didn't. He saw the hurts of the people. He saw that they were in need of a Savior, and he felt compassion. And and the Greek word for compassion is is kind of interesting. It's splachnizomai. Kind of sounds like a disease. (laughs) Maybe it's the next uh, variant of, of COVID. I don't know. But actually, it's a good thing. Uh, there's no English term that actually fulfills what this Greek verb has to say. It could be translated, his heart went out, his guts went out. His heart literally broke when he looked out upon the people and he saw how lost they really were. And in the New Testament, this word is used His compassion, had compassion, is used uniquely for Jesus as a divine act of compassion that he has for the people. So when Jesus gazes out upon the masses and and he sees people who have been harassed, tormented by their past, exhausted by their present, and and frightened by their future, he, he grieves because they have no one to guide them. And, and he sees just how vulnerable they are to the bad teachings and, and to the figurative wolves who we know to be the Pharisees and that they are preying upon them like sheep without a shepherd. And thus Jesus felt compassion for them. And this also shows God's desire for us all to be saved and that when he sees people, he, he weeps and, and wants all to come to him. But in order to do that, Christ needs us. When um, Dwight L. Moody was on one of his evangelistic tours in England, he was approached by by three ministers. Uh, We could say they were Presbyterians, uh, and it could very well be they were. Based on the question they asked him, you see, they were having a problem with with Moody, and knowing that he had been so so poorly educated, at least according to their standards, how could he be so effective? Now, Moody didn't try and argue with him, but he did say, uh, come, over with, over, come over with me by the window. I want you to look out down upon the streets and tell me what you see. Well, one by one, the ministers looked out the window and they, they said things like, well, I see numerous people walking among the streets and others said they they saw uh, a park and there were people in it and others saw the vehicles and the things that were on the street and then they asked Moody uh, so what do you see and it was then that Moody looked at them and he said to them what I see are countless souls who are going to spend eternity in hell if they do not receive a savior, Jesus Christ. You see, Moody was seeing with Christ-like eyes as he looked upon the people. 
And so he was grieving about those who are like a sheep without a shepherd, worried where they were going to spend eternity. And one of the deterring factors that we all battle uh, that keeps us from seeing with Christ-like eyes is really the fact that Satan would like to convince us that it's really not necessary that we go out. It's not necessary because he loves to whisper to all who will listen, people are okay. They're really okay. People are basically good, and God's going to go easy on them. Sin isn't as serious as some people think. Uh, God doesn't expect that much from people. And, and besides, there are many ways to God. God, uh, one way's just as good as another. And if God is really a God of love, well, then everyone's going to be saved, right? So don't worry. Don't fret about those people. They're okay. But you see, that flies in the face of John 14, 6, when Jesus told his disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through me. It is true. It is true that humanity has many needs in the world, but there is one that is that they have that is greater than any other, and that is their need for salvation. And that need can only be found in Jesus Christ. We must see others with Christ-like eyes. It's the only way we can have the awareness of just how lost people truly are. Now, another reason we should see others with Christ-like eyes is Jesus' words where he says, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. This mention of harvest can be taken a couple of ways. Harvest uh, is then and, and is now, actually, uh, an occasion for joy. Uh, it's a time to thank God for a crop that has been uh, both dependent upon rain and sunshine and now is in abundance and to be harvested, to bring in a bumper crop, there's nothing, nothing better than to harvest a crop like that. But the harvest language can also be used to depict a day of judgment, a judgment to come. In that case, the harvest refers to those who have heard and followed the word of salvation and those who are worthy to be harvested, but then there are those who have not heard and they are worthy of judgment. As a fire sweeps over the field and burns the chaff away, it's those who have no need for Christ who say they have no need for him. Now, John the Baptist, actually, before he baptizes Jesus, even foretells what Christ is going to do when he comes, that he is going to burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. We often don't want to hear that, but there is that sense. But Matthew 9, 37 seems to be a combination of those two thoughts that follows. It says, there's a sense of joy because he says the harvest is plentiful. It's a positive image referring to Jesus' current ministry. The fact that he has been going out through all the towns and the villages. He's been teaching in their synagogues. He's been preaching the good news of the kingdom. And he's been healing every disease and, and sickness. It's a living example of, of how to go out and harvest souls. He was reaching people and turning their lives around to him. However, there's also a reference to the fact that the workers are few. And it suggests only a few will pick up on the call to go out and reach the lost before a time of judgment comes. In the following chapter, Jesus sends out the twelve. He gives them authority to drive out the evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. Because as an example, demonstrates the urgency of reaching the lost while there's still time. And you might ask, so when is that time coming? When is Jesus going to return? Well, in Matthew later, in verse chapter 24, 14, Jesus said, when the world, the entire world, has heard the gospel message of Christ, the end will come. Well, I'd say we're probably getting close to that for the gospel message has been preached and is in about everybody's language and anywhere over the world. But the old paradigm for us of, of building a church 
opening the doors, providing programs and expecting people to show up is, is actually no longer working. The harvest imagery, whether biblical times or the present, means we have to go out in order to bring the crop in, not the other way around. The same is true of how we're going to reach the lost today. We do not just open our doors and a, a seeker crop to just walk through already cut, uh, bundled, tied, windowed, and processed and baked and, and sliced ready for the kingdom. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. We got to go out. And you might wonder, Presbyterians go out? <laughs> That's not in our DNA, right? We're not supposed to do that. Well, years ago, I, before I was in the ministry, I used to look at these hands, and they were big hands. They still are big hands, but they were calloused, and they were often dirty. And I often wondered as I was wrestling where God wanted me, how could these hands ever be used for ministry? They're, they're meant to work. And then I realized that we are to be the hands and feet of Christ. And I began to understand how God could use me. But Jesus is not just calling pastors to be the workers of the harvest. He's calling everyone who follows him to actually be ones that go out. Remember that Jesus didn't pick uh, disciples with elite qualities uh, of being the most educated. They weren't descendants of the priesthood, and they weren't even the most respected of the community. They were fishermen, most of them. And then there's uh, Matthew, who's a tax collector. He's despised by the Jews. He's despised by the Romans. And yet, Matthew is one of the disciples for Jesus. They were ordinary folk. They're just like the rest of us, and they were doing extraordinary work. And if we're questioning why God would want us to work the harvesting fields, harvesting souls, we, we need to only ask ourselves, well, I'm, I can't do it, but actually if you're alive and you're breathing and you have a heartbeat, you're called. God needs you. Jesus' harvest imagery is the only way we can bring divine redemption to a world that's plagued by sickness demons, disease, and death, and we only need to watch the news, uh, the headlines, to know just how bad of a situation we're in currently. The only way we can overcome this is to take seriously our call to go out. We should not be anxious for anything because it's actually not us who does the work, but it's the Holy Spirit working in us that actually helps us to be able to say the right things, to do the right things. And we have to remember that prayer is our biggest tool. It's our biggest tool to access and our greatest weapons to empower us to do the work of the Lord. See, it isn't us doing the work. It's the Lord doing the work in us. If we want to be a church that saves souls, that wants to grow in our faith, we must see people with the eyes of Christ, and we must seek and act being aware of their hurts and their needs. And so I ask you again, who is God laying on your heart today? And if you're wondering, how alone can I make a difference? I want you to remember there's a story, a story about a man that was walking along a beach one day, and he saw a, a boy, a lone boy, on the beach, and there were, there were thousands. The beach was just covered with all kinds of starfish. And the boy was picking him up, and he was throwing him back in. The man was just like, boy, what are you doing? I mean, there's thousands of starfish, and, I mean, you can't begin to make a difference. And the boy walked over, and he picked up another starfish, and he threw it into the sea, and he said, I made a difference for that one. You see, collectively, working together, we can make a difference in this world. We can become a movement. Uh, 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 we can do something incredible. But it's because God is working in us, and we're seeing people with Christ-like eyes. 
Amen. Let us pray. Oh God, our Father, we give you thanks for all of your gifts that you have given to us. For the things that we take for granted, the, the daily food, our health, for the air we breathe, for the freedom we choose. And we thank you for the gifts of your word and your power and your love. Our hearts are truly overwhelmed, O oh God, when we consider just how much you have entrusted so much to us. May we be worthy of that trust. May we be people who are unafraid to live as faithfully and as richly as you want us to live. Help us, O oh God as followers of Christ, to multiply all that you have given us, to risk spreading your word and perhaps see it even misunderstood, to gamble by loving those whom others think only worthy of hate, to take chances by doing good to those who have not done good to us. Help us to be faith-filled and a desire to increase your glory and your goodness in this world. Help us to see others with Christ-like eyes. Make us a people who share in both word and deed that which you have given to us. We pray now for your church gathered here today, both here and around the world, that it may encourage all of its members to discover, to develop, and to use all of their gifts, those of nature and those of grace, to further your kingdom. And we pray for those who are poor in body and in spirit, for those who pressed and heavy laden, for those who are sick and in despair. We pray for those uh, who are on our rolls, who are going through difficult times for Pat Denton as she recovers from a knee surgery. We give thanks that Nancy Bingham has returned home and is continuing to heal from her uh, surgery and broken we also pray for Jean Brown as she recovers from her broken hip and pray for good healing. Give thanks for Sadie Crumbly as she has recovered from her back surgery and pray it will continue to go well. We pray for others like Bill Connor, Steve Hoffman, Joe Dablock, Julie Olson, Jody Stone, all those who are battling cancer on one level or another. And we ask for prayers of healing for Vivian Sackoff, Mark Turner, Phil and Sherry White, and Jeff and Jenny Whitehead. And might those we name in our hearts feel the support of your loving arms as they have traveled down difficult paths in a treacherous landscape, and especially we pray for those who have lost loved ones and are finding uh, this time of year uh, especially difficult. We pause and pray for those in silence in our hearts. We also pray for those who serve in distant lands, working and serving in harm's way. Assure them of your loving presence. We pray for peace, and Lord, we pray that we might be able to bring help to those in need. And might their gifts be a tangible reminder of your enduring love. Free us, O oh God, from the things that keep us from sharing your good news. And in certainty of your care, let us pray that prayer your Son, Jesus Christ, taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you now to stand as we affirm what we believe in the saying of the Nicene Creed. You can find uh, the words to this on the inside of your, uh, in the back of your hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, 
the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our offering, uh, please join me in our litany for our offering we will be receiving. We bring our gifts with grateful gratitude for the opportunity to give. We thank you, O Lord, for the bounty that is ours and for the freedom we have to worship as we choose. We ask only that you would help us to remember. Amen. <clears throat>
charge to you that you will hold God's people in your heart. And when you hear the call, that you will say, here I am, send me. Receive now the benediction of our Lord. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.